Well, good morning, everyone. It's the uh, 16th of, what is this, huh? Pardon? July. This is July. July. 16th of July, 2007, and uh, I'm an interviewer for the Public Library uh, of Hamilton County in Cincinnati, and I'm interviewing Harvey Fangman, an old friend. And uh, here we are on the, uh, at the main library, and our camera operator is Dennis Daly, who is a part of the wonderful history program here in the, uh, in the library. And uh, Harvey, uh, you and I have known each other for a while, and uh, in the Hornet Group, which meets every uh, first Friday of the month, and having a good time. And uh, so what we're gonna do this morning is just find out about you and about your experience and everything. And I usually start out by saying, where were you born? I was born in good old Cincinnati, okay. Lynn Street, where oh. it was Laura Holmes. Oh, sure. On Lynn West, Street. Down, down. 1926. I'm 81 years old. Okay, very, very good. Where did you go to elementary school? At Garfield. It's still a building. It's still existing out at South Cumminsville. Okay. And right. it's still existing out there, but yeah. it's not used for a school anymore. Not no used more. for a school anymore. And then where did you go to high school? I, I went to high school. Uh, first, that was a time when Central High School was independent schools. I went to mechanical, and then it was formed after two years into a Central High School. Oh, yeah. And I finished my education at uh, mechanical up on McMillan Street. The building's still up there yet. Right, right, right. Well, that's turned out a lot of interesting people over the years. Oh, it's your hands. My goodness, I should say, a real solid uh, institution. Uh, <clears throat> so then what happened? Uh, uh, you finished high school when you were, what, 18? Yeah, I was 18. Well, what happened? This is where the story starts. Yeah. And you can't believe what happened to me. <laughs> I had so much happen to me that Really, I, I don't want to do anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You've had it, huh? I had it. Well, I'm 18 years old, and uh, I'm ready to graduate, and uh, I uh, worked at Lunkenheimer's co op -ing. Every two weeks you worked at uh, Lunkenheimer's, and you went to Cincinnati. And at Lunkenheimer's, it was real cute, because they made the big valves for the Navy. I'm Navy. Right. And uh, so they made these big valves out there and I was on the boring machine. Well, I love mechanical high school and they taught me how to do machine tools. And I did a lot of machine tooling up there. And what happened, these big valves are for the Navy mm -hmm. Department. And uh, so I knocked them out quicker than what I was supposed to. But instead of turning the piece work in, like most of the guys out there were getting deferred from the service and they were turning into piecework, getting extra money. Well, the day it happened to me, uh, in my spare time, I would go over to the restroom and take a little shut eye. And one day I came out of the restroom and this superintendent of, of uh, Lunkenheimer's was sitting on this high stool where all the time cards are at. He says, Harvey Feynman? He says, how long you been in that restroom? I said, I don't know, sir, what time is it? <laughs> he said, it's 1.30. I said, well, I must have been in there about 45 minutes. That's what I mean. And he hit the top and the time cards went all over the floor, grease and all, <laughs> shavings and all. So he said, you gotta do better uh, to do over there. And uh, he says, I know what you're doing. He said, you're doing great work but you're not turning to piecework. He said, instead of that, you're going in there. You know, I want you to go there. I said, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. I said, I want to learn things. And I said, can I get over to the machine shop where you, you repair things and make different things on different uh, machines now? No, I need you on the assembly line. He said, either get back on the assembly line or get your pay at three o'clock. I said, well, I'll get my pay at three o'clock. Well, that's stunning. I go home <laughs> and my mother says, uh, Harvey, I got news for you. You got greetings from Uncle Sam. Well, I said, I got news for you too, Mom. I just got fired, I think, at Lunkenheimer's. <laughs> she said, well, you got greetings from Uncle Sam. It was a week later, I was up in Columbus, Ohio, standing in line up there, and my buddy was up there with me, and he went through it first, and he says, uh, he asked, what branch of the service you want to get into? And my buddy says, oh, I want to get into the 
Air Force, I want to further my education. <laughs> There's a war going on, you know. <laughs> so the guy says, oh, I think you'd make a better soldier. And wham, they stuck him in the arm with a needle and he got about three feet in front of me and they hollered at him some nasty names. Come back here. You got your needle stuck in your arm. He looked at the needle and the blood was going, not much, down his arm and he just passed out right in front of me. <laughs> so he went up to me and he said, hey, he says, um, what branch of server you want? I said, can I ask you a question? I'm always this, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. I drive my nuts, my wife nuts with doing this. <laughs> but that's the only way you learn. Sure. So I asked him, I said, so, you know, I, in my books I'll show you. <laughs> Let's go back. When I was 17 years old, the bakery man says, you're a nice, you'd make a nice soldier. Why don't you join the National uh, Guard? I said, Oh, I don't know about that. So anyhow, what happened is Ohio National Guard, the minute Pearl Harbor was hit, went to the Philippines, everybody, right. equipment at all. But then they need a home <laughs> guard, so they called it the State Guard. So in the State Guard, uh, I joined them there. So now people see me coming home with an Army uniform on. And I got pictures when I was headed peeled potatoes. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, I asked the guy, I says, um, uh, you know, I went down when I was going to graduate, I said I had another month and a half to go to get my diploma, and I went down and joined the Marines. I passed the physical, and I passed the written test. And the sergeant says, when do you want to report to boot camp? I said, can I wait another month and a half and get my high school diploma? They said, it's very important to have a high school education now. He said, sure, he said, come on back when you're ready. And he opened up his desk drawer and he threw in his papers. And he says, come on back when you're ready. So I go back down there. When I went home, my mom told me, if that, he said, we can't find your papers. So this guy, now let's go back up to Columbus. He says, what branch are you serving with? I said, well, uh, is it a Navy connect with a Marine somewhere? I tried to join the Marine. He's Navy for you, next. <laughs> he didn't want to hear no more. <laughs> so so that, I, then... Uh, but there in Columbus, with that separation of, of personnel and everything, and people going here and going there, yeah. you had a pretty good idea of what you wanted to do, right? Oh yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then they, when I got in uh, uh, up at Great Lakes, well, not until I got finished with boot camp, why well, they knew that I was in, in the machine shop business, and right away they wanted to make a gunner's mate down. I mean, it's tear the guns apart, lubricate them, and all that stuff. So. That's how I got to be a uh, gunner's mate, and, I mean, uh, into the gunnery department. So they shipped me off to uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and at Norfolk, Virginia, uh, I uh, was put into the amphibious force. The amphibious force is the force that over at uh, Omaha Beach, over in France, and then down in the Philippines, all up the Pacific. Those were the boats that the doors would open up, and the ramp would go down and tanks would roll off of them. Right. And the other ones were smaller ones, Higger boats. They had carried the Marines and the soldiers up to the beach. Well, I trained for an LSM. LSM is uh, 203 feet long. That's not very long. And it only draws four feet forward and six feet aft empty. And we call it the ocean going bathtub because I was a helmsman going across the Pacific <laughs> and I was trying to steer a straight course, but to keep the gyro on that point, while well, my wake was like this, going, going <laughs> in the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> so uh, there's another story there. So I, I get in the, uh, and they go down to, they send us, we finish our training, and then they send us to Houston, Texas. 18 years old, a bunch of, you running out of tape? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> 18 years old, we stay in. How can we pick up a ship in Houston, Texas? It's nothing but desert. Well, we were mistaken. When we got down to Houston, Texas, there was Brown Shipyard. That's oh, where yeah. the ship was made. That's where a lot of LSMs are made. Right. So we go on the LSM, go down the little creek, goes down to Galveston, Texas, and there we go over to Gulf of Mississippi. And there they load us up with telephone poles. Oh, a bunch of us team. How in the world can we kill those Japs with telephone poles? So they never did tell us. So we loaded up and we went through the canal. <laughs> we come up and when we got through on the Pacific side, we went swimming down there. 
And uh, right after we went swimming, we seen one of the largest, like tiger sharks. They had white spots on it. That tiger shot must have been, uh, what, 10, 15, uh, 35 feet long. Wow. He was just, uh, uh, like a whale. Yeah. So anyhow, we go up to San Diego and we have Liberty and we go over to Honolulu. Now, over Honolulu, I got a lot of pictures <laughs> there, but it, we leave Honolulu and we go up to Midway and we get some fuel up there and then we head south. And we go all the way down and hit some of the islands over there and we get down to Saipan. We pull into Saipan and we find out what the telephone poles are for. Here they were piling for make piers out to the water because oh, sure. when we invaded an island, all the piers were destroyed, the docks and that. So the Liberty ships just sat out there and these Higgin boats would hit the supplies into the uh, be uh, beach. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we unloaded the poles there, and while we were unloading, the old man left us uh, go swimming. Now swimming on the beach down there. Now this is Saipan, the war's going on. And all of a sudden I hear, Harvey, Harvey, here's my cousin, <laughs> Melvin Keller in Cincinnati. He's over there working for the CBs, building the airstrip on Saipan, which we needed so bad. So then we leave there and we start going up there. And we, we go to different islands and that, and finally the main thing we get up to Okinawa. We just captured Okinawa, secured it. And there we are in the bay there. And okay, the worst. Now, wait a minute. That was uh, April, May of 45. 45. Right. Yeah. yeah. And there, the worst typhoon in 20 years hit Buckner Bay. All the ships that could go, uh, let's say, are like, uh, 12 knots or better headed for the open sea but we only had did about nine so we had anchored there I was put on a midway a midnight anchor watch up on the bow we had two anchors and one on the stern and one on the bow and we were slipping in the bay all the time headed for the beach the wind was coming from the ocean in there now this is a God's honest truth that wind took Liberty ships and put them up on the rocks, halfway up on the rocks, mm. and it took other LCI ships where, where the troops went down on the starboard and port side of it. Mm. Uh, it took one of them and rammed it right inside of the LS, I mean the uh, Liberty ship. And um, while I was on watch there, I went out to hatch that night, midnight, and my buddy says, Harvey, for God's sake, hold on to the rail on the pipe on the bulkhead, and we just had a, ca uh, a cable for a railing there. He's because your feet are going to go right up in the air, and that's exactly what happened. My feet went right up in the air, and uh, I moved my way up to the beach there. And there, sailors were floating by us, hollering help. You couldn't hardly hear them because mm. the wind was so strong. The wind actually took our camouflage off of our LSM and made it back to a gray ship again, like wow. the Navy Gray. The wind and the salt just took the paint right it off our ship. It back. So these sailors were hollering for help and they couldn't do nothing. Oh my God, they were only 20 feet away from the ship. We had a line throwing gun. We tried to, to which is a steel rod, you put it in a, in a shotgun like that, shoot it over to the shoreline to get your first line over across. We try using that and shoot, you shoot it off and the guy turned thing went down, sure. wouldn't go to the, the men. So then after it was over with, we were on a, a detail. <laughs> this is really funny. This is God's honest truth. <laughs> uh, some people don't want to hear this, but we are on a detail and we went over to Ocean Going Tug. And it was one that, Ocean Going Tugs, you have deep hulls to them. Oh, yeah. That son of a gun was high and dry up on all those rocks in Buckner Bay and Okinawa. Hmm. We unloaded the ship, but you can't believe what we unloaded off of that ship. Cases and cases of whiskey. They were for the <laughs> officer club. Well, they were allowed to have it. Of course. So then we were, deta uh, we were told to go on to the... Um, uh, ferry boat from Ayashima. Now there's Ayashima, uh, that's where the Marines raised a flag, but yeah. this is Ayashima. Right. It's a little island northwest of Okinawa. We were, 
running supplies back and forth over there. And finally one day we were loaded up with a, backed on a uh, road grading machine and a big bulldozer. I think the blade was, must have been made for a ship because the bulkheads on the starboard was only missed that much. So we're sitting over there and the war's going on and we're thinking, what are we waiting for? What, what, what's the sense of hell on a road grading machine? We're, we're in the fighting force. We should be carrying tanks and soldiers. So the day came, we were told to go. So we headed up to Japan. And on our way up to Japan, another storm came in there. The water was so quiet and so smooth that these flying fish, when you go in the ocean like that, these flying fish come alongside the boat. They're disturbed and they go out and they just glide over the water. The mm -hmm. water dripping off the fish made little rings in the water. That's what really happened there. Oh. So we go up there and we're headed for Nagasaki where the first A-bomb was dropped. And we go into the Bay of Nagasaki. Well, they, they, some of our troops were in there some way or another because there was flags flying from some of the guns. And it, there was enough uh, flags flying around up there. Uh, it looked like salt on a black piece of paper. So we go into the bay and there we see, and I got pictures of all this stuff. I can back it up my story. This one two-man submarine factory was like these twisted pretzels. If you put them on a piece of paper, that's the way the, the atomic bomb came down to zero ground level and destroyed everything and melted. These iron beavers just twist them. So we're headed right for this wall. We can't believe that the old man, uh, well, that's improper, the captain of our ship. <laughs> the captain of our ship was gonna destroy our ship hitting that six foot wall all around Nagasaki. Sure enough, doors open up, we hit the rocks and the ramp went down, the bulldozer went, started hitting that wall and he got into that wall and he go boom, 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 boom. And the road grading machine was right behind him, low and off. And within 10 minutes, these big LSTs was twice as long as the size of us start unloading rubber tile vehicles and going all over Nagasaki, one, two, three. And well, what happened is when we went in there and LSM's got two screws in the back. One of them are got bent. And you can't run a motorboat or anything with a bent screw. No. So, <coughs> pardon me. So we uh, go back off and we go to a little island right there in the center of the bay. And it was a uh, China factory there. But the whole island was con uh, a China factory. We could not find one teacup or plate that wasn't broken there and it was all blue and white china. Everything Beautiful. was blue and white china. Beautiful. So we stayed there and they put the new screw on. We carried a, a, a guy, I don't know where we got our uh, new screw from. And we put on a ship and then we left there. And we head back to, uh, back to Ayashima. And then we loaded up again. And this time we take uh, gasoline drums and uh, high octane aviation gasoline. And this time we're headed for Hiroshima, the second city by hit that eight ball. By the way, I got pictures of Nagasaki with my own camera. Mm -hmm. And I got pictures of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And we go in there and on the way up, we took about a dozen airplane pilots. And those poor guys, man, they couldn't stand the rough sea we had going up to Hiroshima. And a lot of them got so sick, they just laid on top of the gasoline drums. They wouldn't go below deck because that's when it, it's worse for that's you for seasickness. So we go into, into <clears throat> Hiroshima and we docked there where it was a seaplane airport like, right in the edge of the water there. And that night, a bunch of us, I don't know where we got the beer cans, but we got about six beer cans. A couple of us went up on the bow of the ship and we put them in a bucket and blocked the key cans so they wouldn't float and lower them down in the water. It was cold up there. Mm. Cold enough to get beer, but all night long we pulled up and never did get cold, <laughs> so we drank warm <laughs> beer. So we head back to Okinawa again, and this time we loaded up to Wakayama. And Yakiyama was a big naval port up there. And when we went into Wakayama, we went, I got a picture of 
when uh, Japan's huge battleship, they scuttled it itself and it went down the water, just enough water, went deep enough to get water over its main deck. Mm -hmm. And as we're going in Wakayama, there was this big round, uh, what the heck you call them? Uh, my mines floating in the water. And um, they had these big uh, points on them, about that big and round, and about that long stick now. Mm -hmm. And when we were, we were part of um, watch seamen, and we had a watch for them in the water. One time we went by one, I bet it was no 20 feet away from us, we went right past it, you know. And we unloaded the, uh, the uh, I don't know what we had on our ship at that time. But then we went back to Okinawa and we started loading up supplies there. The war was over, the bo bomb dropped, caused the war to be over, and we're taking excess army stuff. Now, a lot of people get excited at us destroying army equipment over there. Like one time I was in charge of destroying ammunition and M1 rifles and all that up on Okinawa. And we had to destroy that, that ammunition uh, because they had an excess of it and ammunition gets aged. So we destroyed that, but the thing that got me was when we loaded up these Batan diggers that they dig trenches, mm -hmm. all these Batan equipment was brand new. And we'd take them out in the, beyond Buckner Bay out there, the deep sea, and we had chains on them and pull them off and drop them in the water. Oh, Buckner Bay out there is loaded with so many jeeps, and I don't know about tanks, but I do know about tans because we dumped them. And I do know we destroyed an awful lot of guns. Now, were you, uh, were you actively involved in, in dumping material too? Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I stayed on that ship all that time. Now, you were a, you were a gunner's mate. Yes. Very good. Uh, I, our ship had a, uh, I was captain of the, of the twin 40 millimeter. Now the yes. early S LSMs only had a single 20 millimeter gun, but ours was a later one built in Houston, Texas, and it had a twin up there. And um, we had uh, about four 20 millimeter guns on the sides there and some 50 millimeter rounding machine guns. 50 caliber. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they were, those are well, primary that, for <clears throat> zeros coming over. Sure. That was that was a lot of uh, that was a lot of armament for uh, a small for craft. A, like for two hundred and three feet, yes. I should say that so. was uh, a really uh, <clears throat> over. And the LSTs were the backbones because they could our could only handle I think three four tanks, mm -hmm. and um, they were primary used for vehicles. Right. But the um, Oh, LSTs over in, in uh, Europe, they were used for all kinds of supplies, everything. Oh, yes. That's right. And uh, now, did you carry? Uh, did you carry uh, cannons, guns on that for no for shore use? No, we never no. had a tank on her. Like I said, we carried telephone poles over to yeah. the Saipan. The war was still going on, and we moved up the islands up to. We were primary supply. I as the islands we hit, very, very uh, good. taking supplies from one sure, island to the other. Sure. So we got Okinawa, and we loaded up on that, uh, that uh, bulldozer and that road grain machine, and we just sat there, you know, and then finally the bomb was dropped and the war was over, and we still sat there. We couldn't figure out what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> 18 years old, all we want to do is kill the tap. Of course. Now I got some fantastic pictures. When we were going overseas, we were made flotilla command. And one night we were at, over, in convoy over in the Pacific. I don't know where it was, but everything was dark and black. And this is another true story. You'll never believe it. <laughs> I'm on mid-watch. I always got to mid-watch. I don't know why. But I got on mid-watch to be helmsman. I go up the tower on our LSM was like a submarine tank, just a round tank. Halfway up it was a bridge where all the signalmen put up the flags, the signal back and forth to the ship. Well, that was a buddy of mine up there. So this night I climb up the ladder and there was my buddy leaning over the rail watching the 
phosphorus in the water going by. Mm -hmm. And I grabbed him by his belt and his collar, and that didn't lift him, I just grabbed him, and I said, I ought to deep six you. Well, <laughs> the truth of the story is, my heart just dropped out of me. It was a flotilla commander, Commander McGee. Oh my goodness. I set him down, I didn't lift him up, I just let go of him. <laughs> And when he turned around, I see who it was. I couldn't say nothing. I, I just didn't say excuse me or nothing. I went up the ladder and I would start steering the ship and the wake was going like that. <laughs> and you know, he never, never said a word to me. And this is a true war story that many people don't tell. Uh, but he was such a nice commander. And one day I get called down over, over at uh, Aishima I get called down there in the war room. Well, the only time you get called down the war room is when you're in trouble. Right, right. And I said, whoa, wait a minute, what <laughs> did I do? And so I go down the war room and the gunner officer says, um, Commander McGee wants you to be his private, personal chauffeur for the weapons carrier. And I thought, oh, he's going to kill me. <laughs> what happened is we found a weapons carrier on the beach over there. I don't know what island it was. It wouldn't run, and our mechanics uh, our, uh, that run the engine of our ship, they repaired it and got it working and kept it on. The old man said, that's all right, we can keep that. So then um, one day we go up there after the war is over, the commander says, um, uh, take me up to this Quonset hub so-and-so there, and go up there. and." He's picking out stuff, and I had to carry it back to the weapons carrier, and it was a bunch of clothing. Uh, generally, CB, this is when we're destroying all the uh, oh, yeah. equipment on Open Now. The war's yeah. over, destroying right. the equipment. And I take armful of uh, clothing and shoes. And finally, 18 years old, I had the nerve of anything. <laughs> I said, Commander, may I ask you a question? He says, Yes. I says, some of my shipmates are out of shoes. We were out of shoes over there. We didn't get no new shoes, and we cut the toes out of them out there. For our feet would be so hot. He says, "Sure." He tells a man, "He says, give him twenty, give him two dozen of shoes." <laughs> <laughs> so I go back. So I made out with the shipmates uh, real good on board oh, ship. Oh, so you did. You know, I, I wanted to ask you. Uh, you mentioned uh, the island Ayashima. Of course, that's where Ernie Pyle was killed. Yes, and I great got great war correspondent. Yes, and I got a picture of my camera of his monument. Oh, and I was right there by his monument. Oh, yes, wonderful. Ernie Pyle got, yeah. and that's right near, uh, far from there is where I found this Japanese sword. Oh, and I got a regular Japanese sword, and I got a picture in here of a Japanese with that very sword, not that individual sword, right, but with that type. type very type of that I'll be sword. Done. And then when I went uh, in Nagasaki, I got a little, uh, we, they left this room up uh, over the hill. In Nagasaki, when the bomb dropped, everything within the direct line of that bomb was annihilated, melted, burnt. But you go up over the hill, and there was these Japanese uh, villages up there. And they didn't have glass over there in those days. They had paper, oil paper to light in. And you go up there and you had to take your shoes off. And you were allowed to go in there and talk to people. And, mm -hmm. and, and there we were using two or three cigarettes, buying stuff. And then after the Navy was there about a, a week, then it went up to packs of cigarettes, and then it went up to cartons of cigarettes. <laughs> but I bought this Japanese flag about that big, a red circle, and I got all my shipmates a signature, signature. on it. Oh, and I got treasure. all the dates that we hit all the islands over right. there. What a treasure. So uh, I, got, I got a lot of history. Yeah, that's but a the, wonderful thing. Uh, Harvey, the, uh, uh, the attitude of the men over there now, this was after the bomb was dropped. Mm -hmm. And uh, you didn't experience any residual effect from that or any, you didn't really, did you know about it? I mean, you knew. Well, what the I was. I wasn't really. I didn't. We didn't kill no. We didn't shoot no planes down. Uh, what happened is that I wasn't really in the war like the Marines were mm -hmm. on the beach where they had to shoot them in the trees and all that stuff. Yeah. So I didn't have that much remorse against them. I guess 
when I went up there for Liberty sure. in Nagasaki. Oh, wow. But I will say one thing up there. The Japanese people, I didn't like that. Every time you walk past one of them, they bow to, down to you, you know? And one day we were loading the, uh, unloading the gasoline drums, and this is how their, their society was revolved around the elder and the young people. We were unloading these gasoline drums and we had these Japanese people. They weren't prisoners, just Japanese people. Uh, unload them and all the old men, elderly men, were unloading the, the gas drum. One guy, uh, one Japanese elderly man picked up one of our Navy belts and handed it to me and I said, no, you can keep it. Well, he wouldn't take it, you know. And finally he real politely laid it down the ground because they were told not to take anything. Mm -hmm. So. They're moving the drums out, and all of a sudden, this couple young guys are, are telling them what to do, and they're not doing nothing. You know, and these poor old guys are, I'm 18 years old, and think, hey, you know, you're making the old guys work. You get down there and move some of the drums. And so I told them to get down in there through hand motion, and somebody reported me. And the beach uh, master, after got hit, the ship half unloaded, he come aboard there, and he chewed me out. He said, don't you ever, ever do that as dense. He's over here. He says, the old people work, the young people don't work. They're the ones that get them pe people to work over here. Mm -hmm. He's that's the way their, their religion is, worship them, mm -hmm. the emperor. Mm -hmm. And he said, and don't ever do that again. Mm -hmm. So I never had no more trouble from then on. Well, that, that, was, that was a tremendous experience to uh, enter, enter work with the people mm -hmm. right there. And, uh, uh, you saw the destruction of the bomb. I got Nagasaki. pictures of the destruction. I walked on the streets over there. And this is what I don't understand is they talk about, I live only a few miles from what used to be Ferno. Right. And uh, the, the fallout of the bombs over there, I don't know what, I got the date when we went into uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but why did I get some radiation on me? You know? That's amazing. Well, apparently it don't last very long. Mm -hmm. But I got pictures in here of what the radiation did to the Japanese people. Uh, they're dark complected, and it raised their skin up maybe uh, an eighth of an inch higher, that new growth where they got burnt from the rays. Mm -hmm. uh, it's real light, no pigment in it. So I got a picture of a woman in here, uh, how she got hit with the radiation of it. Wow. And um, the, the streets over there, I'm telling you, they were just like they talk about Berlin. Berlin was nothing but uh, mm -hmm. rubble over there. There was nothing existing in Berlin hardly at all. Everything was destroyed from our right. immense bombing we did. So, but the Japanese people, uh, I don't think they really hate us over there. I think they were kind of glad the war was over, you right. know. Yeah. And, yes. and uh, they were suffering something awful oh, by the, the, the right. nasty regime they had going over there, you that's know. That's right, that's right. And, um, well, they were, they were, you know, they were really cannon fodder. They just, oh, yeah. and, and of course they were suffering the terrible attacks, you know, from yeah. our bombers and everything. But um, uh, Harvey, it, it's, it's uh, wonderful to talk to you about this because this is an interesting aspect uh, that you don't hear very much. And that is the immediate uh, later part of the war, uh, and then after, and the occupation. And uh, so, did you stay ashore? No, well, I was on the ship all the time. On the ship all the time. Okay. All we did was carry supplies up to to Nagasaki, unload those, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, unload the uh, bulldozer and oh, road yes. in, in uh, Nagasaki in the gasoline drums in Hiroshima, and soon we got unloaded there, we pulled right off and headed right back to uh, Okinawa. You know, this is very interesting what you're, what you're relating to us, and this is so important for people to understand, and that is that our humanity, okay, they started the war, we had to finish it off, but we helped them oh, we after sure the did. end of the war. We helped them clean up their country, we helped sure them did. with their economy, and you were a part of that. Well, just a real little bit of just taking <laughs> some supplies <laughs> up there for our armed services, though. Oh, I know. But, but what, 
what was so about my experience in Japan was the war was just over and the occupation forces, the soldiers were in the, in the country someplace because uh, we weren't really the first ship in Nagasaki. No, I understand. But we were as far as going in to get the main supplies hitting uh, Nagasaki. And if we would have had that invasion over there, this is something that the people have to understand is that yes, it was sad that we killed all those elderly men, elderly women, and young children over there, because there were no young men left over there. It was sad in one respect, but it was a godsend that we killed all of them because then the emperor and the war mongrels over there decided to stop the war. Yeah. If we would have made that invasion over there, heh, you think Iwo Jima was something? Iwo Jima was something? You think Okinawa, 30,000 uh, Marines lost over there? Why, we had a, I still, we, we were still fighting Japan yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't think we'd ever capture that island. Well, they were so determined and yes. so dug in. They were. And it was indeed, uh, uh, it, was a, it was a terrible decision that uh, President Truman had to make. But at the same time, he saw that the importance of it was that it could end the war quickly. Yes. Instead of a prolonged war. Because, as you know, uh, you know they were really dug in. Well, it, you're talking about dug in. I got, uh, my daughter just got me some tapes of uh, Ayashima. Uh, I mean, uh, I can never get those two islands together again. Ayashima is where I was. I, Jima is where the Marines were. Right. The loss that Marines had in there, the Japs were in, those islands over there are nothing but coral and they have caves in them. Oh yes. Made by the water in them. That's right. Well, they were embedded in those two places uh, in Okinawa that the flamethrowers, the only way we won, I think the Marines won the islands was with the flamethrowers. They burnt into them. And by the way, when we went, uh, we, while our ships were being, our ship was being loaded, we got the chance to walk all around Okinawa. And I got pictures in there of what the harbor at Naha was a big city in there. You used to see all the sunken ships in, in, in wow. the Naha there. And when we went up on one of these uh, little mountains like there, we went in the cave and the Japanese people buried their uh, a deceased people in germs about this big and round, about that high. Mm -hmm. And the top was just big enough for the skull and all the other bones were separately put in there. That's how they buried the people. Uh -huh. And uh, so a lot of those, uh, a lot of those uh, germs got destroyed in that and there was bones laying all over the place in there. You know, it was like our cemetery, you yes, know, our castle right. getting raped and that. Of course. But. Uh, well, they, the, the, um your contact with the with the elderly people in Japan that in Japan that yeah. was that was very yeah. interesting a lot of yeah. people didn't have that experience you did yeah they they, they did not have uh, no uh, they were so uh, I think indoctrinated that you do what you're told and that's life there's nothing else you don't have no reason to question anything discipline the discipline was so strict over there, and th that's the way the Japanese were raised. Yes, all their lives exactly, over there. Exactly. But now, now it's different. Yeah. Oh yes. It's well, the whole world's changing, Harvey. You yeah. Know? It's a lot yeah. different from <laughs> from when the, what we remember so well. Yeah. So how long were you there uh, in Japan after? The just island? just those three oca occasions. Okay. Just a. Uh, uh, Couple of days to uh, unload, a couple of days to get there, unload, and pull off and head back to Okinawa. Hit Hiroshima, unload, pull back. Well, Nagasaki, we, we stayed there longer than a couple of days because we had to get the screw put back on the ship. Okay. So I guess we were there uh, maybe a week or, but we were on the island there, yeah. not, not in Nagasaki. Not, not in the city itself. By the way, that bomb when it destroyed Nagasaki, Everything within its line of sight was destroyed. I mean everything. But on the other side of the hill, where the direct rays of the bomb didn't mm -hmm. hit, paper windows 
the little bamboo shacks were still in existence. Isn't that amazing? And they, they had the shoot, and you had to take a sailors, mostly sailors. Uh, I don't remember seeing an army man in Nagasaki when we were there. And uh, the sailors had to take off your shoes in front of their building there. Be their respectful. Door. Yeah. And we were respectful to them and they were respectful to us. Yes. Yes. And they were giving us stuff, anything we wanted, we offer cigarettes, they'd give it to us. Isn't that something? Um, now at this time you were a gunner's mate, third class, and then what uh, did you achieve second class? And well, I didn't see second class until I was called back in the Korean situation. Oh, I see. 1950. Oh my God. And then I was called back in for a, a, a destroyer <laughs> escort there. It was in uh, Brown Shipyard in, uh, no, Hunter's Point in San Francisco where they put the new hedgehog gun on there. Tell and us that, about that hedgehog thing. That hedgehog at that time, 1950, was very secretly. Uh, you had a fire control up high which could steer and make these 24 spigots go any shape, pattern in the water. So the idea was this, is when you were chasing a sub, no matter what direction that sub would go out to the starboard, to the port, or straight ahead, or off real sharp to the, to the side, this hedgehog pen would form a pattern and all these 24 bombs would go out in the water hmm. and they were set for depth and they go down the water so deep and they explode or if they hit the submarine they explode and this was top secret in 1950 because I was put in charge of the gun and uh, I was told anytime we get inside of land I had to put the canvas over and cover it all up so we went from Frisco this is 1950, I wasn't involved in, in the war over Korea, 1950 when the war was going on. We went from San Francisco down to San Diego. And there, in San Diego, every morning, we, the submarine down there would go out and hide in the water, and we'd take off later and go out and hunt for it. Mm. And when we would find it, the, the sub would, uh, when we found the sub, the sub would leave a die marker come up out of the water and say, you hit us, you know. You know, this is interesting because um, you, you've done so much <laughs> and you've had, I would say, uh, uh, to me at least, an unusual experience. Uh, you came back from Japan and were separated. Uh, in, uh, in 1940... 45. 45. That, that was another story. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> we, we come, uh, when, the, when we finally left Okinawa, we came back over to Hawaii and San Diego and go down through the canal. And uh, we come up the canal up to uh, Gulfport, Mississippi. And I was offered another rate advancement if I stayed on board the ship because the gunnery officer was gone. Anybody knew anything about the paperwork aboard the ship, it was going to get decommissioned. We're all gone. So I said, no, I, I had no reason, no girlfriend back home to come to, really. And um, I said, no, I think <laughs> I'd rather go, go to New Orleans or Berber Street. So I had to yell on another ship, fix my papers up, instead of going from Gulfport, Mississippi to Great Lakes. Naval Training Center, where I, I entered into the Navy, I had him fix the papers up for me to get discharged in New Orleans at the Air Force Base there because <laughs> I wanted to go to Bourbon Street, you know? I was a little girl crazy back then. <laughs> so uh, I get my papers and I get on the bus and I go to, to the airport over there. And <laughs> some officer says, what are you trying to pull off here? He says, you get your butt on that train and you get up the Great Lakes. You need, uh, so what happened is I wind up with a separate, another discharge. I got three discharges. <laughs> World War II and the Korean down to New Orleans and the one that's really up in Great Lakes. <laughs> so on the way up to, uh, to um, the train ride up to St. Louis, why? Well, for some reason or another, I got very attached to this girl and I was about ready to jump off the train and go with her in St. Louis and I thought, nope, 
I know better. I stayed on a train, I went up and got discharged. <laughs> and, and that's probably a good thing because yeah. the wife to whom you're married was, well, a, was a hometown girl. No, that was, this is my second wife, my regular wife that <laughs> I met after I got out of service. She died of leukemia early oh. in life. And this, then I married Carol, which is now, she was never married before. But what was a funny story about uh, when I got discharged up there, uh, let's see, all of a sudden my mind went blank because <laughs> when I got out. What, Great Lakes? Yeah, I got Great Lakes and I came down to Union Terminal. That's when Union Terminal, oh, it was a magnificent oh, yeah. uh, building down there. And all those things that are over the airport now were down in the, in the where the, all the trains stopped down sure. there. But then I got called back in the Korean situation, and that's when I, I was married to my first wife then. And I got loads of pictures of, of the ship there. And then when we left San Francisco down to San Diego, I didn't stay out there long. And some reason or another, they wanted me on a, a regular big a DD can, 2100 can. Mm -hmm. So that was the Wisconsin. And I went on to Wisconsin, and then we, they were putting the ships all back in commission. Sure, for the Korean And uh, San Francisco was a great big graveyard for ships putting Cosmoline in there. Oh, yes, right. And so we, when our ship got commissioned down in, in, in uh, San Diego, we went through the canal and we come up, up the... Um, West Coast to Maine up there in Bath, Maine. And Bath, Maine, uh, I got discharged and went to New York and came on home then. Well, you, so, <laughs> you really have had some tremendous experiences. One more. Okay, oh, One more. we want more. Remember, I said I was a very dedicated, I still want to uh, uh, would fight for my country, but when I called call back into the, um, uh, Navy in 1950 for another two years. It was two years in, in World War II, right. two years, and two years in, in 1950. I still wasn't in the reserve. And then I went to New York and got on the latest battleship built, the USS Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And there I got on board that ship and we went down to Costa, uh, Puerto Rico. Costa Rica down South America. Mm -hmm. Puerto Rico, and while I was on there, I was uh, training and put in charge of the quad 40 millimeter, and guess where that was? Right on top of turret three. You know, battleships have three turrets. Right. One, two, and three, right on, the right on top of the fan tail there. Hey, when we went in gunnery practice, I'm telling you the God's honest truth, I could see those shells once they left those big barrels, 16 inch shells, big I could see the sun was gonna disappear. Taken off. Yeah. Wow, just imagine. It, 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 so I had a lot of experience. Now, when you went, when you were called back to Korea, did you go back at the same rate? Or did you get an No, I, I was- You uh, got an advancement? I got advancement aboard the uh, Spanger, USS Spanger, the destroyer escort in right, San Francisco. Right, right, right. When I went back in, in there. Well, the difference between <laughs> the difference between your your LSM and then the Spanger, the DE, quite a distance, and then the Wisconsin. Yeah, the biggest battleship afloat. My goodness sakes alive, that must have been. But you had all that experience when you got to the Wisconsin. You had a oh, tremendous yeah. amount of experience. Yeah. In fact, I don't know how come I had had this, but this a lot of sailors saying he's full of wind <laughs> because I was on battleships. And you don't get a, a bed. I still had an iron bar and a canvas cut for a bunk, you know. Right. But I was on the main deck because I had to get up to the top of, of turret three. Right, of course. So I could look out the hatchway there, and so help me God, I could look right out and see the water because I was on the main deck. Oh, yes. Yeah. And then I go to a reunion the uh, Spangler reunion in, in Gulf, uh, in uh, Myrtle Beach. Uh, yeah, Myrtle Beach. And there we get, take a tour up to the uh, North Carolina battleship that's up there. Wilmington. At Wilmington. 
And I go up there and I got bad knees and I'm determined to see what it's looked like in one of those turrets. Mm -hmm. So you, to get up in a turret, you got a hole about that big. Right. See how big I am? Mm -hmm. And I got up in that turret and looked around and I couldn't get down out of there with my bad knee. <laughs> I had to get help to get out of the turret. <laughs> so I think, boy, when there's GQ, that's why all sailors normally, during the war, they were skinny. You never saw fat sailors hardly at all. General you quarters. might have seen the ones that work in the mess hall. General quarters. But you, you had to get through such small places. <laughs> you know? and, uh, so I, I, I got some pictures of that down there too. But, um, well, that's wonderful. You, you, uh, the important thing about what you did, Harvey, so much, um, not only during the war, but in, in, in immediate post-war and the occupation and your contact with Japanese people and yeah. so forth and different generations. Mm -hmm. That is priceless. And uh, today a lot of people, you know, don't understand, uh, yeah. don't understand World War II. We have a problem with that, you know, in education today, as you well know. Do you do any uh, speaking to uh, school groups or anything like that? No, well, no, the only ones I do is just a, a flag phone summary with this, uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars. Yes. Uh, I'm in the Honor Guard there and I put my Honor Guard outfit on because the kids like that. Of course. You know, fancy of course. uniform. Oh, that's wonderful. And uh, I get them, I have a big long flag there <laughs> and I get these children to fold that flag up. Oh boy. And man, they, they fight over who was going <laughs> to fold that flag. They all get a chance. That's but, a nice honor. That's uh, yeah, a nice and they honor. fold that flag, you know. Dying. You ever see a flag folding? Oh, yes. spread it out. Oh, bring it up to the triangle, yeah. the final right. triangle. No red or white showing, only no the... No star showing either. It, oh, I mean, the star showing, but so the end is tucked underneath oh, it. Only the union yeah, you don't shows. See the, oh. You don't see the uh, end of the flag. All That's you see right. is the blue, the union, and the white stars. Well, now tell us about your family. Well... You're in Cincinnati. My family... Um, you know, the funniest thing just happened. Guess what happened uh, this morning on the news? Fangman's made the news this morning. Oh, really? Yeah. You remember the guy that was in charge of the police department down there? Oh, yes. There? Yeah, yeah. His relation, I think, is Paul Fangman. Had a son. He and Paul Fangman and, and Paul Fangman's son were up in Indiana, I believe it was, at a lake. And the little one drowned up there. Oh. So, getting back to my relation, I've been wanting to make a family tree. And there's a heck of a lot more families in the phone book. At one time, there was only about 23. Now there's a bunch of them in there. But You're all related somewhat? I don't know where it is because I had a bad, uh, a bad start off. My family tree goes like this. When my father was born in 1899, his father, which is my grandfather, was... Uh, beer master here in Cincinnati. You know, Cincinnati was one of the beer capitals oh, yeah. in the world. Right. And it had something like over 25 breweries going on in Cincinnati. So uh, he was a beer master there and he was born in about six or eight months after my dad was born, his mother passed away. Oh. So Grandpa, being a bureau master, didn't have time to raise a child, so he had this amp. Now, this is a line where I don't want to get in this discussion about religion, but there's a thing happened here that my aunt belonged to a religion, and her husband was lazy, wouldn't do nothing. She worked in a laundry, and she got her arm caught in a, a laundry machine oh, and got it goodness. severed here. So she tried to raise my dad up, and my dad only got to about the third grade in, in school, and the aunt put him to work. She was supposed to use the money that the bureau master gave her to, for his education in that particular religion. She didn't, she sent him to a public school and she kept the money. Hmm. So all the Fangmans are, in, are Catholic on that, on that one segment there. I understand. And the reason my dad was a black sheep then because he was Protestant, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, 
In doing so, I find out some of my relation, uh, and, and they are the ones that are connected here, the one up in um, Cherry Grove, Al Fangman Real Estate. That's mm -hmm. the only one I know, really. I, I understand. Well, when you, uh, when you came back, now you had had your high school education. Yes. And uh, what did you look forward to as far as uh, the rest of your life? Oh, what happened is I came back out of the service and I'm down there and uh, I tell my father, I said, Dad, I don't want to go out Lunkenheimer's again and stand on all those shavings and all that grease and that. And when the whistle blows, you got to go to work. And when your lunchtime, your whistle blows, you can go to lunch. I said, I don't know. He said, well, why don't you, he said, hey, there's a telephone man out there climbing pole. He said, why don't you get a job down at the telephone company? He said, they've got good retirement. And they pay good. Not very much, but they pay good. So I go down to, I call up my cousin, not the one I met in Saipan, a different cousin. I said, buddy, let's go down and join the phone company. He said, okay, we go down to 7th Street and we joined the phone company. Well, what we didn't know, we didn't join the phone company at 7th Street. It was Western Electric, the maker of Bell Telephone Equipment, installing these exchanges. That's the company we hired out with. <laughs> <laughs> so we, go, <laughs> we go, go to work for Western Electric, and my cousin couldn't get a job because he didn't have a high school diploma. See where a high school diploma oh, came oh, in? Absolutely. absolutely. This is when I got a job at a telephone company. You had to have a high school diploma. Oh, yeah. So what happened is, they told him, you can go to Chicago Mail or her house, make up those two credits, we will hire you, you'll have a job. So on the way back home, he said, no, he said, I'll get a job down Ryerson Steel making $50 a week. He said, you're gonna go to work for a telephone company for $29.50 a week. He says, no, no, he said, I'm gonna be a truck driver. But what happened is, as I progressed in the telephone company, my wages went up, up, up. Sure, sure. His wages stayed the same. Mm -hmm. My benefits went up, up, up. And so uh, I was way ahead of me. Well, you were very, very wise and very, very, uh, uh, very sharp about that. And Harvey, I know it served you well in your life. And you served as post commander of your VFW and uh, we're members of the Hornet group. Oh yeah, lovely. That, I'm, I'm isn't sure. that a great outfit? It is. This is the one where we meet the first Friday of every month yeah. and uh, just get together and talk. Yeah. And you know, we thank you so much for your great service to our country. <clears throat> you're, uh, you're a great patriot, you're a family man, you're a church man, and uh, you've been a solid citizen and we congratulate you for all of that. And thank you for your service to our country. Well, thank you very and much. And we're, we're about at the end of our tape here now. Yeah. And uh, Dennis Daly has been watching us very carefully to get this all recorded. You're going to get a DVD for you and the family of, of our interview here today. A copy goes to the Library of Congress in Washington, and a copy stays here in uh, Cincinnati, so at the library. So your history. Uh, you're on the record, you're in the archives, <laughs> and uh, your, your uh, progeny uh, from generations on can come and uh, take that. It's just, I just want to add one thing. Okay. Interrupt you, please. I did not see the action like the Marines did getting ashore, shooting, well, killing people. I didn't uh, have the opportunity to do that because the time young. we got Saipan, the island was already Secured. Uh, secured. We went up to uh, Guam. It was secured. Right. And we get to Okinawa. It was secured. Mm -hmm. And then we go over to Ayashima. <laughs> but there, there's something happened there at Ayashima. The airplane pilots, when they land, the war was over. They land their planes, and all of a sudden there'd be a bing. And all of a sudden, just a pilot would come out of the plane and drop dead. The Japanese over there, they didn't know the surrender was Those over yet. Snipers. And they got into these belly gas bell, uh, wings mm -hmm. that, on airplanes, and when they expanded the gas, they just dropped them in the ocean. Oh. They got in those belly tanks and just had a little hole in there, and they yeah. had their, their food in there. Isn't there was suicide it? like the kamikazes, sure, sure. and they, they'd only shoot a pilot. Sure. Well, that <clears throat> I'm glad you added that to it, because that's something that we haven't heard about no. before. And uh, you have been 
a, a tremendous patriot, and I know your leadership in uh, peacetime through your uh, post and everything. We want to thank you for your service to our country. It's been an honor to talk with you, and uh, it's been an honor over the last two years for me to be a friend of yours. Yeah. And we thank Same you here. very, very much. I'm very appreciative of it. Okay. Thank Ari, you. God bless.